As we continue our Lenten journey, how can we be nourished and strengthened by the Word of God? Join us today as we talk about the Word of God in the church's life in our own lives with Dr. Scott Hahn, professor of theology at Franciscan University and author of Consuming the Word, the New Testament and the Eucharist in the Early Church. I'm Michael Hernan, Vice President of Advancement at Franciscan University in Steubenville, Ohio, and you're watching Franciscan University Presents. Stay with us. Welcome to Franciscan University Presents. Today we're talking about the Word of God. I'm your host, Michael Hernan, Vice President of Advancement at Franciscan University in Steubenville, Ohio. I'm joined here in our studios with our regular panelist, Dr. Regis Martin, Professor of Systematic Theology. And today we're joined by a special uh, guest panelist, uh, Dr. Donald Ashey, Professor of Theology here at Franciscan University. And no stranger, our guest today is Dr. Scott Hahn, who is both a professor at the uh, Franciscan University for about 20, 24, 25 years. Yep. And uh, you hold the chair, the Father Michael Scanlon Chair in Biblical Theology and the New Evangelization. You uh, founded the St. Paul Center. Uh, you have your PhD from Marquette, and you're an author of about 40 books. I can't keep up with uh, all the books that you write, but today we're talking primarily about consuming the Word. Uh, this is a great, great text talking about the Word of God. So just to start us off, um, what do Catholics mean when we, we refer to the Word of God? Well, I mean, it's interesting that we use the word, word, and we know what we mean at one level. It's the uh, inspired scripture, and yet when we look into the scriptures, we discover that the word is pointing beyond itself to the word made flesh. Mm. The catechism distills it nicely when it says that Catholic Christianity is not a religion of the book, but it is a religion of the word. But the word, of course, is a person and not merely a page or a set of pages. And what a difference that makes. It doesn't in any way devalue the inspired word, by subordinating the inspired word, the incarnate word, you actually end up endowing sacred scripture with a certain sacramental quality that we could discuss later on. But I mean, the word, word in Hebrew and Greek is always bigger than the English word, mm. word. Yep. <laughs> is this what most sharply distinguishes us from our uh, separated brethren? I mean, yeah. they're Christian, but they're not Catholic. But right. is that? No, the, the, the Protestant tradition would customarily echo the words of Islam and Judaism in describing itself as a religion of the book. Hmm. In, in no way does it deny the incarnation of the right. word, but yeah. it does prefer a definition that really emphasizes sola scriptura, the Bible right. alone. Yeah. yeah, and so as we look at the word, uh, it, we even define it even more, particularly as we look at the New Testament. Right. You know, so, so what, what does the word even New Testament, since we're talking about words, I want to get this <laughs> yeah. right here. The New Testament, what, what does it refer to? Well, you know, the, the phrase New Testament or New Covenant are two English translations of the same Greek phrase, kine diatheke. And so these are interchangeable. These are synonymous, practically speaking, at the, at the superficial level at least. It's important to realize that the phrase New Covenant actually occurs one time in the Old Testament. Jeremiah 31, 31, where the great prophet predicts the messianic period will usher in something hitherto unheard of, un unexpected. It will fulfill the old, but it will also surpass the old. It won't just simply restore the status quo. So, you know, when you look into the New Testament, here again, you, you find the phrase employed, New Testament, in the New Testament, especially at the climax of the Eucharistic institution narrative that Luke supplies us in chapter 22. In verses 16 through 20, which is the culmination of this great Passover mystery, uh, Jesus speaks these solemn words that we know so well, you know, this is the cup or the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new covenant, the blood of the New Testament, again, either way, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins, and then he adds, do this in memory of me. Right. I think it's significant then to notice something that just I missed for many years, yeah that the New Testament doesn't call itself the New Testament, it refers to the Eucharist as the New Testament. Right. And the only time Jesus ever uses the word testament or covenant or the phrase New Testament or New Covenant is precisely at the, at the culmination of instituting the Holy Eucharist. 
So I like to put it the way in the book, you know, that the New Testament was a sacrament long before it started to become a document, mm. according to the document. Yeah. Isn't that impressive? I mean, and so many people, Christians, evangelicals, call themselves New Testament Christians sometimes. And right. you refer to that, and yet we as Catholics sometimes forget that that is the context upon which the scriptures, the document, actually spring forth from. So, I mean, that's a profound Isn't difference. Right. If we put both things together that you've just said, if we come to the New Testament, we're talking not just about words about something, but what God is doing. That's right. And if I want well, to be like, yeah. a Christian of the New Testament, I've got to participate in that doing. The words can help me understand what God is doing, but what He's doing is the priority for me but, being a Christian. Yeah, and, right. and, and exactly. Scott, what, what you're saying uh, represents a pretty uh, withering indictment of, of non-Catholic Christians. Uh, I, I don't know if you want to put it quite so polemically, but it seems to me that if your assent to the articles of the faith stops short of this Eucharistic presence, then you're not really Christian. Uh, right. You've, you've yeah. something, you're, you've got to be left behind. You're in the dust. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's really important to see that the word that we look at in Scripture points to the eternal word made flesh, yeah. and the New Testament we read so carefully, again, points beyond itself to Jesus being the New Testament. It's not enough to say that the New Testament was a sacrament before it started becoming a document, or yeah. the document. You've got to see that the sacrament is Jesus himself. Right. This is my body. Hello, this yeah. is the cup of my blood, the blood of the New Testament. Do this in memory of me. This is the Eucharist. The Eucharist is the New Testament, and the New Testament is Jesus. Right, right. I mean, and, and that's just almost too profound to let go. I mean, this is I know. overwhelming. I mean, it, it's, it's a series of self-evident propositions that took right. me forever to find, you know. And once I discovered them, I just kind of assembled them in a certain way, and I began to share them with my separated brothers and sisters, right. close right. friends, really, who yeah. I've stayed in touch with over the years. And it's a kind of rhetorical technology that I didn't see uh -huh. or develop on my, it was just like, this really just synthesizes what the early church fathers assumed. Right, right. And when you you know, so, some place. of us cradle Catholics, I, I think, may be entitled to ask, why did you remain so clueless uh, so long? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if, 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 if it's not a word, but a presence, if, if our faith is not a book, but the embodiment of the eternal word who mm. becomes flesh and is scandalously uh, uh, prolonged and reproduced in the sacrament of the altar, uh, if that's it, then... <laughs> Where is everybody else? Uh, what happened to them? You know, don't they underestimate missed the boat. Don't underestimate the force of deeply embedded habits, <laughs> <laughs> especially when they're shared by practically everybody. Yeah. Uh, because you know, the, the sacred scriptures are so holy and revered. We venerate the scriptures, as Dei Verbum in Vatican II put it. And so as we approach the scriptures and we're so habituated to seeing Old Testament new, right. you know, it should come as no surprise that when we think about how Christ fulfilled the old in the new, we still tend to think that the New Testament is literature more than liturgy. Right. It's a document more than a sacrament. It's a page more than a person, yeah. you know? Yeah. And, 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 you and to break those, through those clouds is... When you make those distinctions there, it goes back to what we said about the fathers of the church. Their experience was different. They had the liturgy and then the scriptural documents, literary things came later. They had the Eucharist first, then these words that we call the New Testament describing what's happening in that event, what God is in fact doing they experienced first, and then it was described later for them. Yeah. And what the fathers were doing was largely a reflexive imitation of what the apostles also yeah. were doing and assuming, because even before Luke wrote his gospel and the account of the, yes. institution, the institution of the Eucharist, Paul wrote 1 Corinthians back in the mid-50s. And that's actually the earliest occurrence that we find where we find kine diatheke, New Testament, New Covenant. Yeah. And once again, what is Paul writing to the Corinthians? It's the Eucharistic institution narrative. In fact, when you look at all of Paul's letters, Corinthians has more of the Ipsissima Verba, the very words of Jesus that we find in the Gospels, though the Gospels hadn't been written yet. But throughout Corinthians, the one section that we find the greatest concentration, the deepest density of Jesus' own words is precisely here in chapter 11. And what's the occasion for Paul? To remind the Corinthians of the centerpiece of our faith, the source, the summit, the climax of it all, which is the Eucharist as the new covenant. And so when you step back and look at this, you wonder, you know, it's taken me years to, to recognize the obvious. And you flip it around and you realize it took years for the New Testament Christians to even have a New Testament. Right. You know, they weren't sitting around waiting and wondering, what are we supposed to believe? Why won't these 
apostles sit down and start writing epistles and gospels. You know, Jesus said, do this in there. And that's what they all did. Over half of the 12 never ended up contributing a single book to the collection of 27 that we call the New Testament. But they weren't disobeying orders. Jesus didn't write anything. He didn't command them to write anything. I'm glad some of them did. But they didn't have to. Yeah, you know? yeah. And so we're following a pattern that the early church had where the sacrament, even in our lives, too many Catholics think, oh, I, I'm not a scripture scholar. <clears throat> and they don't dive into the Bible as much, and which we need to. But really, we are all, as, as faithful Catholics, going to Mass. We are frequenting the sacraments. Which we're is renewing what the a covenant. Yeah, yeah. This is we're, the covenant we're, with we're all We're experiencing that. the primordial form of the New Testament, the original New Testament that Jesus established. Yeah. You know, and this is, this, is a, this is a big breakthrough. And I want to underscore what you just said a minute ago, Mike, because we need to read the Scriptures. We need to, but we need to read them in a way that is clearly ordered to receiving Jesus. Mm. You know, we receive Him in prayer, we receive Him in baptism, we receive Him in 101 different ways, but nothing quite like the Blessed Sacrament. Right. The Word made flesh. Yeah, yeah I mean, we, we live in an age of proliferating Bibles. I mean, you make the point, which I, I thought was pretty uh, uh, amusing, that uh, the, uh, the early Christians would not have known about Bibles <laughs> in motels. I mean, they didn't know about <laughs> motels. Uh, but. Uh, since we're returning to a pre-literate age, I mean, nobody's reading anymore, uh, does this make it easier for us to embrace this enfleshment of the Word? Yeah, I believe it really does. Uh, I mean, for better and for worse, right. you know? yeah. because when the Word became flesh, that flesh became food, yeah. you know, and, and it just shows us this pattern of divine condescension. God will stoop down to our level however low He has to right. go in order to raise us up right. to His level. But I mean, back in the first century in a pre-technological pagan period and in a technological neo-paganism, you know, God's power is, is, is manifest in His mercy. I, I've seen something of that in my own children. That is, they've gone to the liturgy years before they've learned to read. Right, yes. And reading is not the first thing on their mind. They want to participate in the liturgy. They want to get the Eucharist. And all the while they're hearing and understanding the Scripture as it's in the liturgy. They're hearing the homilies, but they don't feel any pressing need to get a book this, this to start point, with. They may later, but it's your not point the first thought. I mean, this brings us full circle yeah. because that insight isn't just a practical experience. It really gets at the very heart and soul of what covenant or testament means because it is a family reality. I, you know, I was researching covenant for decades before just, you know, I reached this point of clarity and simplicity. But in ancient Israel, a covenant was so different than a contract. A contract, this is yours and that is mine. And a covenant, I am yours and you are mine. You know, so your children come to you and Michelle and relate one flesh union. And so, you know, more is caught than taught and much more is lived than written yeah. in a family, yeah. which again explains why when you take the family that God has formed up to the supernatural level where a new covenant is still new 2,000 years later, yeah. it's because it's an eternal family that we're a part of now. He took what is ours in our human nature to give us what is His. Well, in, in a way, your, your kids are closer to the mystery because they're not distracted by books, right. <laughs> <laughs> which is a delicious irony. I mean, you're, you draw upon a culture of literacy, I mean, a blooming book, to make points that really antedate uh, the Gutenberg press. Right. Uh, I mean, that's sort of uh, 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 disconcerting, isn't it? Yeah. It is, you know, <laughs> but when you go back to antiquity, you realize that uh, Plato and others had this insight, writing in the Phaedrus, Plato warned against writing because yeah. it kind of, it, it disconnected right. the, the, the spiritual bond between teacher and pupil, which he described, interestingly, in terms of father and son, parent oh. and child, yeah. because it's so much more than biological, communicating life can, consists of truth and values. You know, he said you write when there is distance, you know, or when there's a death. Yeah. or when there's misunderstanding or distortion has to be clarified. Right. But writing invites even more misunderstanding right. and yeah. distance sometimes. Mm. And so this is where I think the Eucharistic form of the New Testament brings us back to an intimacy that Christ died and rose to establish. Yeah. And it's yeah. like the good news is almost too good to believe at that point. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that is powerful. So, ever so briefly, we've talked about the Word, we've talked <laughs> about the hard. New, I know, but the Word Gospel. Yeah, what, what, Uangelion. Uh, it, 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 of course, we, we speak of the four Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We speak of the Gospel that Jesus proclaims, 
but more, f- more fundamentally, we speak of the gospel as being Jesus himself. So just as Jesus is the New Testament, so he's also the good news. You go all the way back to the Old Testament, and there again you, see the, you, you find where the seeds are sown. In the second half of Isaiah, the proclamation of the good news for those who are in exile is precisely where Paul derives this notion of euangelion, the good news, mm. the good message, the proclamation. Uh, and so, once again, we're reminded by the page yeah. of a power that goes beyond print, and that is, as Paul writes to the Galatians, faith comes by hearing, right. not by reading. Yeah. And when you read yeah. the Word, you realize hearing comes first. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's powerful. Stay with us on Franciscan University Presents. The Eucharist for me was a turning point in my discernment um, to enter into the Catholic Church. As Jesus says in the entire Bread of Life discourse in John chapter 6, he says repeatedly over and over again, "Eat, eat of my flesh, drink of my blood. And so I realized that if this is what the Catholic Church believes, then everything else that the Catholic Church professes to believe must be true. Oftentimes I hear the Lord speak to me at the Mass through the responsorial psalm. Uh, the psalm in which the human heart is crying out to the Lord um, in, in, a, in a lot of emotion, um, whether it be jubilation or sorrow, and joining those emotions um, and asking for the Lord to hear him, um, asking for um, his heart to be quenched, the thirst, for, the thirst for the divine to be quenched. People recognize Franciscan University as being academically excellent and passionately Catholic. We have the unique opportunity through our faculty members, through our students, to proclaim that academic excellence by reaching out in many different ways. We also remain passionately Catholic in the way in which we are able to worship, the way in which we are able to uh, bring that love of Christ to others on a daily basis. It's important for us to be able to embrace both. Welcome back to Franciscan University Presents. Today we're talking with author and professor Dr. Scott Hahn about the Word of God. This is a subject that is near and dear to your heart um, and it's something that obviously affects all of us as Catholics. Um, when we think about the, uh, the, the scriptures, when we think about the evangelists who wrote the New Testament, what did they consider to be the scriptures or what did they consider to be sacred? Well, you can tell in the Gospels they considered sacred the same thing Jesus and all of his fellow Jews considered sacred, and that was the law and the prophets and the writings. The writings we would consider part of the Psalms, the wisdom literature, and that sort of thing. That threefold division of the Hebrew Bible that we might refer to Mm -hmm. as Tanakh these days, Torah Nevi'im and Ketuvim, uh, this is something that we can call the canon but it's something that was relatively obscure back in the first century. You kind of knew what was there at the center, which was the Law and the Prophets, but the periphery was sort of blurred. Because, you know, when the Old Testament or the Jewish Bible was translated into Greek about two centuries before Jesus in Alexandria, Egypt, we call it the Septuagint because there were 70 elders employed to do the translation. Okay. Uh, and and the, the, the Alexandrian canon actually is the larger canon that Catholics use. It also happens to be the same sacred writings, the same collection that the New Testament writers are always quoting. So that's what they referred to. That's right. Okay. Now later on we speak of a shorter canon, the Palestinian canon, which Jews use today, that Protestants follow, which has seven fewer books in the Old Testament, but the Palestinian canon actually comes much later. The earliest we actually find any reference to it is around 90 AD, which is about 60 years after Jesus' death and resurrection, you know, 20 years after the destruction of Jerusalem, at a point where the the parting of the ways was nearly complete between Judaism and Christianity. And so I would say the sacred books were the Hebrew Bible, but most especially the Septuagint, the Greek Old Testament that the Catholic Church has really followed. Hmm. Because oftentimes we hear the evangelists uh, referencing, you know, Scripture. And they're not talking about the Bible that didn't exist. They were talking about the Old Testament as we would know it, and that was part of the original beginning of the canon. But I I think it's helpful uh, to remember that when Jesus would would cite the Scriptures, it's not as if he had a little companion piece in his back pocket and he would pull it out and and cite uh, Scripture and, 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 you know, the Law, the Prophets, and the Writings. 
Uh, he was steeped in this. This was an oral culture. This was a pre-literate age. And, and the, the scriptures that he knew had been spoken. He heard them. And he was rooted in that. Uh, and it's not just because he was God and he didn't need to memorize these <laughs> texts, but like any uh, pious Jew, uh, he was immersed in a world that was defined by the sacred library. But it wasn't, you know, a collection of books that you would check out of uh, your local library. They were stored in the temple, most likely, and in some synagogues right. they had collections yeah. of the scrolls. But very few people had paperbacks. That's right. Okay. They weren't in their homes. Right. Or apps on their smartphone. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you made a wonderful point uh, at the end of uh, the first session that I'd like to revisit. You, you talked about before people read the scriptures, they heard yeah. the scriptures. And, and that set off a, a bell in the back of my head because it seems to me that even before they read or heard, they saw. I mean, that opening scene in the Gospels, we have, who is it, uh, Andrew and John seeing Jesus in the near distance, and, and John the baptizer pointing to the Lamb of God. Uh -huh. I mean, nothing yeah. is really heard yet, but seen, and they follow. They follow their eyeballs mm -hmm. uh, in search of this man, this extraordinary man, whose sheer exceptionality somehow rivets their attention mm -hmm. for the rest of their days. And they haven't read anything yet. That's right. I, I think the first sense is the sense of sight, which is a quintessentially Catholic faculty. You see, then you hear, you remember, you write down, and you organize your life around that visual encounter. But it's always drawing you to the person of yeah. Christ. So yeah. faith comes by hearing, mm -hmm. but not just, you know, a tape recording. Right. It comes from hearing the voice of a person you see. Right. Right. In this case, the person is the Word made flesh. Yeah. Yeah. Come and see and hear. Yes. And then later on we'll be reading and right. exegeting and that sort of thing, you know. So, I mean, if faith is born from an encounter with the incarnate Word, then you, you've got to see Him. You have That's to right. take if in it was, this, this if it, event. If it was a new contract, the printed page would suffice. Right. 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 But it's a new covenant. It is a family bond. Yeah. And so you can write letters to loved ones when you're far from home, but you can't wait to get back. Yeah. Does that yeah. tie in with what we said about the appreciation of sacred scripture for the evangelist or the New Testament writers, that, that is what they refer to what we, when we say, oh, here he's referring to the Old Testament, they're referring to people and events more than ideas. Is That's that right. accurate? You know, they yeah. talk about it, what that happened is, that more is exactly than what, what is an idea there. When Paul speaks of the Old Covenant or Old Testament in 2 Corinthians 3, he's talking about Moses right. and the veil that he had to wear because the people couldn't look upon the glory even though it was minimal and fading. You know, so even there, it, it was written in letters on stone tablets to kind of show the distance. In yeah. fact, it's, it's the contrast that Paul is making in 2 Corinthians 3 between the inferior form of the Old Covenant precisely because it's in letters right. on stone sig signifying this detachment, and then the New Testament is unveiled access to the very face and glory right. of God. Right. And written on, the, on our hearts. That's right. Uh, and and Paul sense. describes himself as not being sufficient or worthy, not to be an author who contributes to the New Covenant, right. but to be a minister mm. of the New Covenant. Right. He describes himself as a diaconus, a, a deacon of the New Testament, because the New Testament was a sacrament to be administered right. more than a document to be written, even though he's writing the document right. while he's saying all this. So, so what's, the, what's the attitude or the perspective of the evangelist, the early church, towards Scripture that should affect or has influenced us today in our understanding. Well, you know, it's interesting because we often tend to assume that fundamentalists have a really high view of Scripture and liberals have a low view. And in fact, you know, uh, this is a perception that is true outside of our tradition. But I'll never forget my professor who I had uh, in seminary. Two doctorates, one from Harvard. He could speak like eight or nine languages, a massive mm -hmm. library. And the humblest man, you know, when I had lunch with him. He was really chagrined that I had poked, as he put it. <laughs> and, you know, and then afterwards, he, when we had reconciled, he said, you know, perhaps you've come to the kingdom for a time such as this because your church has maintained the single highest view of Scripture uh, of mm. any denomination, you know, in the midst of all. And he said, you know, you, you've got to remind them because these scholars in your tradition seem to be following another path, you know. Uh, yeah. And, you know, we, the church gets it from Jesus. You know? right. right. It's His high view of Scripture which we are imitating. Mm. But I think it's important to recognize that from the very outset, the church has this view of Scripture that is derived from the incarnate Word. Mm. Not only we have 
Jesus' view, but we also see it as subordinate to Jesus. You know, I, I point out in the book something that I think is more than just interesting, it's significant, that the phrase New Testament is a, is a, a sacrament before it's a document, but the first time we actually find the phrase, the books of the New Testament, is around 190 A.D., oh. and it's an anonymous document. Yes. And even there, it's not being called the New Testament, but the books of the New Testament, because the Eucharist is still the New Testament in 190, you know, 150, 160 years after Jesus' death and resurrection. But these are the books that have been written for a liturgical occasion. The liturgical occasion is the Eucharist. And since the Eucharist is the New Testament, and these are the books that were written to be read and proclaimed in preparation for the celebration of the Eucharist, we'll call these the books of the New Testament. Yeah. It's a liturgical collection. Right. Yeah. It's a liturgical way of reading and understanding. But as a matter of historical fact, the, the canon of the New Testament wasn't ratified until the end of the fourth century. From 380 to around 397, right. we see the Synod of Rome, and Carthage, and Hippo canonizing the New Testament or forming what we would call the table of contents. You know? <laughs> These are bishops who are doing it. And they're doing it at the same time that the Roman canon is being canonized. So the Eucharistic canon and the New Testament canon are both being canonized right. at precisely the same time right. to bring about liturgical unity. Right. It's a liturgical book for a liturgical mystery, the Eucharist. And the continuity of this sort of thing has mm -hmm. eluded some of the most brilliant historians who attend to these documents but fail to see these are signs that point beyond themselves to mysteries. Yeah, so, so it goes right to your point that this isn't just an interesting historical fact, but this, is, this goes right to the heart of what the scriptures were created and canonized and put together for. If, if, if I could uh, mm. suggest what, what strikes me as, as a very instructive uh, illustration of the whole argument that you're making, not just here, but in, in this really marvelous book, one of the luminous mysteries that, that John Paul gave us was the proclamation of the kingdom. Mm -hmm. and, and what's really uh, uh, shattering about that episode is Jesus doesn't draw attention uh, to a kingdom that is somehow external to himself. Mm -hmm. It's self-referential. I am the kingdom. Uh, he is proclaiming himself, advancing himself, someone to see, someone to celebrate, someone to consume. It, it, it's not mm -hmm. something out there. It's right here in your midst. I am the kingdom, I've burst into time, the eschaton is right here. What are you gonna do about it? That's yeah. right. That's the centerpiece, a person. Yeah, and, and I love just the, 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 the whole title and the, the direction of the book, Consuming the Word. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, that's just, it's, a, it's a, the perfect way to describe what we as Catholics ought to do. We should consume the Word, and we see it in the old and we see it in the new. We are called to consume it, and not just let it be a book that's on a shelf uh, that, that's left out. But are you suggesting that, that Scott wants readers to buy the book and then eat, eat it? it? Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. Because there is a song like that goes with that, too. Yeah, well, he was saying he wants us to eat what the book is all about. That's, that's right. right. That's Consume right. it. And, and Let it be if part you don't of you. have that experience of the Eucharist and consuming the Word in that sense, the description of the event, of the experience that you might find in the book of the Bible isn't going to resonate in the same way, isn't going to make the same sense. It will have value, but it's have much more value to the person. I recognize that. That's happening in my life. That's right. right. You know, the fact is we all have to deal with appetites, especially hunger, you know. That's right. And, it, it, and the, we know the adage, you are what you eat. You know, this is a good situation because, you know, in the Old Testament, the opening line from our Lord to Adam is, do not eat, for the day you eat of it you shall <laughs> surely die. But they ate it anyway, right. and their eyes were opened. Whereas the New Testament is, take and eat, this is my body. Yeah. And in the famous scene in Luke 24, it's precisely when Jesus takes, blesses, breaks, and gives them the Eucharistic bread. Their eyes are opened, but not to nakedness and shame, but to the resurrected glory of the eternal word. Mm. You know, and you get a sense of anticipation even in the old, because the prophet Ezekiel in chapter 2 and 3 is commanded to announce the word of God to the people who need hope because they're facing exile. Yeah. But the word comes to him in a curious form. Here's a scroll, eat it. <laughs> yeah. And don't proclaim the word until you have. Yeah. And so he eats the scroll, and then he can proclaim the word. Similarly, in Revelation 10, you have the apocalyptic seer, John, being commanded by the angel to right. take this little scroll and eat it. Right. And he does, just like Ezekiel. So prophets have got to consume the word before they proclaim it. Right. But in a certain sense, baptism makes us all prophets, priests, and kings. So we're called to consume the word 
And then we're able to kind of go back and give it to other people yeah. as well. Yeah. Okay, so you're really inviting people on, on a journey, a road to Emmaus That's right. uh, in wow. this book. Um, so that at the end of it, uh, they, they face the mystery uh, itself uh, and can welcome this uh, incarnate word uh, into their hearts. Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly, I mean, this in so many ways was written to be the sequel to another book called The Lamb's Supper, The yeah. Mass is Heaven on Earth, which was for me the breakthrough, the eureka moment where I went to Mass as a Protestant and suddenly, you know, much to my shock and delight, I'm finding the visions of John in the Mass, the right, Eucharistic, yeah. and the Liturgy of the Word and the Liturgy of the Eucharist. And the, the consequences of that just kept reverberating, you know, so that years later I am still thinking through the implications that the liturgy is biblical and the Bible is liturgical. Well, what difference does that make? Yeah. Well, do you have several days? You know, yeah. differences beyond number, uh, mm -hmm. and and it's not just a quantitative difference. You end up getting much more out of the Bible right. when you read it from a liturgical standpoint, precisely because you're reading it in precisely the same terms that they wrote it for. You That's know, right. That's profound. I mean, because as we look at this, we've got New Testament Christians. We've got <laughs> the Word alive in us. It's consuming for us, but it's hopefully consuming us in our lives. Right. Um, New Testament Christians is right, but I mean, if you're going to be a New Testament Christian, you better be a Eucharistic Catholic. That's right. It's pointing us to the Eucharist. Uh, stay with us on Franciscan University Presents. As a graduate theology student here at Franciscan University, one of the main pulls for me to come here was to be able to study scripture. I had heard the quote from St. Jerome, ignorance of scriptures, ignorance of Christ, and I didn't want to be in my life ignorant of Christ. The Psalms are prayers of real people who have gone through struggles, and they always end in hope. And in our own lives, we go through struggles, and um, we fall, but we always have hope, and our hope is in heaven. I pray the divine office, the liturgy of the hours, being a member of the priesthood discernment program here at school, and there's a Psalm verse that comes to us that reads, as the deer yearns for running streams, so my soul is thirsting for you, my God. And that's only fulfilled in the reception of the most holy Eucharist at Mass. Explore the treasures of your Catholic heritage on a Franciscan University pilgrimage. Led by inspiring spiritual directors, you'll walk in the footsteps of saints and martyrs in the Holy Land, Poland, France, and Italy. And you'll deepen your love for Jesus Christ through daily Mass, confession, prayer, and the joy of Christian fellowship. Let Franciscan University lead you on a pilgrimage of faith. Find out more at franciscan.edu slash pilgrimages. Welcome back to Franciscan University Presents. Uh, this entire program springs forth from the very heart of Franciscan University. Uh, this is being taped right now in our, our communication art studio here in Steubenville, Ohio. Our students are operating the cameras and the equipment. Our panelists are faculty uh, here at the university. Today we've been talking about consuming the word with Dr. Scott Hahn. This is a great book. I really encourage you to pick it up today. So Scott, we're in the middle of Lent. We've talked a little bit about scripture, uh, the word of God. Help me put this in the context of, of a Lenten journey as, as our viewers are looking at what can they do in the midst of this Lent right now? Well, the first thing would be to pick up the Bible and mm -hmm. begin reading it and listening to the voice of a father who loves you more than we can possibly imagine. Mm -hmm. the, the second thing is to recognize the fact that the Word was made flesh. You know, I think a lot of times we think that, you know, Jesus was too human to be divine. You know, at least that's what people outside the church think. You know, and I, I think we have fail to reckon on the fact that, that God's power is made perfect in our weakness, as mm. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 12, 9, that uh, he stoops down to our level but does not end up being encumbered by our limitations. You know, he lifts us up by his power. And so our own humanness is what we find in Scripture, the humanness of Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Paul, and Peter, and Jude, and all the rest, but the humanness of Jesus, the Word made flesh, we can see how God accepts us just the way we are. Mm -hmm. But He loves yes. us too much to leave us that way. That's right. And so He is intent upon illuminating our minds, enkindling our hearts with a fiery love, but also just showing us that it isn't the case, well, you know, when you were young, my strength was made perfect in your weakness. As we get older, we get weaker. Yeah. And God gets stronger. 
Yes. And Lent is that kind of time where fasting and prayer and scripture reading and more prayer mm. just enables us to accept ourselves the way God does. Not some sort of, you know, making of excuses, but an acceptance of my own finitude, my own failings, but a longing to be holy and a longing to prepare to receive the resurrected Lord at Easter. Mm. You know, it's a, it's a journey because life is, but it's a journey that is encumbered by our weaknesses because Christ was. Yes. Yeah. But the resurrection that ends up being celebrated is precisely what gives us hope. You know, St. Benedict in his rule speaks of the joy of Lent. The only time he uses the word joy is describing <laughs> Lent. Yeah. Which isn't the first mo thought that comes to my mind. No, <laughs> right but it, it should be yeah. an experience that we have when we realize that God's mercy is so oh. powerful, oh, that is, more that is. powerful than our failings and our yeah. capacity to sin. I even see in this, you know, when we had the year of faith last year, um, just diving a little bit more into the catechism yeah. and um, just going to the section on prayer and looking at how Abraham, it just drove me back to scripture. How did Abraham pray? How did Moses pray? Looking at all of these ways that even during Lent we can dive deeper into scripture to look at our forefathers in faith, whether in the new or the old, but to see that fervor and to really, understand they had a true connection to Christ as we do today. That's, that a, great, made that's a great section of the catechism to look at the fourth and final pillar yeah. where prayer is described as a struggle and a battle. Mm. And so is Lent. Yeah. <laughs> Lent is a struggle and at times a battle as well. It, it's also the voice of hope, the language of, of mm. desire, of longing. And, and Bernanos has a great line, blessed be sin if it teaches us shame. It, mm. it also uh, induces a kind of humility and acknowledgement that I'm naked. Uh, I'm helpless, I'm broken, and, and so maybe I can turn to God who in His grace will take pity upon my, my nothingness. And, and when you think about it, grace without a broken nature doesn't really have much to do. Uh, it needs to penetrate uh, and to pervade and change and transform uh, that brokenness, and, and that's exactly what, what the machinery and, and dynamism of grace was, was somehow fashioned uh, mm. to accomplish. Uh, I, I was struck by something you said. Uh, it was a kind of throwaway line uh, in the last segment. You have so many of those, and they're really <laughs> sunbursts. Uh, this, this was a, a bombshell. You, you said the discovery that you made as a Protestant at a Catholic Mass uh, that really changed everything. I mean, the whole landscape of your life was changed. And as a cradle Catholic, it's hard to appreciate that because I, I sort of grew up with the mystery. It, it wasn't something strange and forbidding. But you awakened uh, to that fact, and it seems to me that here is where the rubber really meets the road. You can't find an issue that is more sundering between Protestant and Catholic Christianity than Eucharist. I mean, for us, it's the center of the universe. It's the sine qua non. But for the Protestant world, it is anathema. And, and how do you square the two? It, it really does require uh, the grace of a conversion. Something has to come in from outside to lift you out of, out of this, uh, uh, this world. You know, it's funny you'd bring this up because, you know, this book was about five years in the making, but largely due to a, a, a conversation that I was having with an old high school friend from mm -hmm. the 70s. I ran into him at an airport and he recognized me and he came up and he said, oh, Scott, I've been looking forward to seeing you after years, it'd been like 30 years. And he said, you know, I want to tell you, I'm an evangelical Bible Christian now. And uh -huh. he had been a cradle Catholic in high school. And I'm like, well, Chris, I'm an evangelical Bible Catholic Christian. <laughs> and he was in shock. And we got, we got reconnected on the phone and he couldn't wait to kind of turn the cafeteria tables around on me and said, well, I'll put the question to you that you used to put to me. And that is, where in the New Testament do you find the sacrifice of the Mass? Because he said, you taught us back then that the Eucharist is just a meal. You know, yeah. the sacrifice is Calvary. And, and I said, okay, and I, I have to summarize it now. I said, Chris, first of all, Calvary is the consummation of the sacrifice. We agree. But I said, if the Eucharist is just a meal, Calvary is just an execution. You know, only by looking at the Eucharist in terms of the way Jesus instituted it in the context of the Passover yeah. as the Lamb who came not just to celebrate the Passover of the Old Covenant, but to fulfill it by giving us the Passover of the New. You know, then and only then do we understand His words, this is my body which will be given up for you. That isn't just rhetoric. This is the cup of my blood which will be poured out for sin. That isn't just ritual. I mean, the reality of what he's doing is what transforms the Roman execution from an execution into the consummation of a sacrifice that was initiated. Now, thankfully, we had months and months to talk. And we were talking on the phone 
frequent when I was driving out to a seminary to teach a bunch of future priests uh, a course called Scripture and Liturgy. Yeah. And so I would frequently put away my notes and say, mm. I got to tell you about this phone conversation for the last hour. And I would tell them, and then I would come home and write this. <laughs> yeah. Because this was so much the fruit of, of trying to distill and simplify for a, a cradle Catholic who had become an evangelical Protestant and then reverted, you know, and right. came back right. to the church yeah. with that evangelical fervor that is so Eucharistic. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. You know? and, right. and to me, uh, when, when, you, when you experience that grace, you realize how much more God loves us than we realize. Right. When I was talking to Chris on the phone, I'm just like feeling God's love flowing through me to this guy, right. thinking, you know, I hope you're letting Chris in on this secret, right. how much right. you love him. Right. And I felt like he was saying, I'd like to let you in on that secret because you're not just a conduit. Right. I, and I'm like, whoa, whoa, no, not, don't go too far here. Yeah. But Lent, again, is one of these yeah, opportunities sure. we have. We're like, we're too sinful, Lord, for you to love us. No, you know, it's like, your capacity to sin, Scott, is virtually unlimited, but it's no match for my capacity to sanctify you right. and to make you a saint. Yeah, as Jesus told Pascal that, that uh, extraordinary evening, uh, Blaze, I love you more ardently than you have loved your sins. Uh, mm. and, and that, I mean, that's the pledge wow. that we wow. need. And, and if, if it's not a matter of just stating mm. it, but showing it, then how could God show more radically uh, his love for sinful humanity than to break himself to become bread, what to was become the food. Quote? I mean, Jesus appears to him uh, uh, late in his life and, and says, you know, Pascal, uh, please remember that, 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 that in my agony I thought of you. I have loved you more ardently than you have loved even your sins. Wow. And, and that, that was enough. That was the catalyst that wow. moved him to, to exclaim certitude, certitude, joy, joy. Yeah. And, and I mean, this was it. This sealed it for him. Yeah, the certitude of faith, hope, and love. And, and I think about Lent. Lent prepares us as a time of preparation for Holy Week, for the Triduum. And what is, what is happening? What are we recalling? What are we representing? Is the, is the sacrifice of the Mass. That's I mean, right. this is a, a most beautiful time to dive into right. the, the, the understanding of what the Mass is, how it's placed in the life of a Christian. I mean, it, you said it earlier, it's the center of the universe for us. It is the font and summit of our faith. Uh, yeah, I so, mean, arguably the greatest recovery in the last half of the 20th century was the Paschal Mystery. Mm. And it began before Vatican II was even called, you know, yeah. Pius XII, restoring Holy Week and the Triduum and bringing out the Paschal Mystery. That it's not just how much Jesus suffered on Good Friday, it's how much He loved us when He instituted the Eucharist. Mm. You know, love is what makes suffering a sacrifice. Love is proven to be genuine by suffering. But, you know, and, and suffering certainly purifies that love. But the combination of Jesus' love in the Eucharist and His suffering on the cross is really the source of our salvation. And He doesn't just bear a cross for us, He bestows one on us. Yeah. Yeah. And in the process, He also bestows the Holy Eucharist into us mm -hmm. so that we are powerful enough to suffer in a way that we can never suffer right, yeah. lovingly on our own. There's a wonderful line in, in Lewis uh, where he says, love anything, even a dog and it'll break your heart. And you know, Jesus loves us and it broke his heart. We broke his heart on the wheel of the world's injustice and yet uh, he surmounts that, that hatred and indifference by this gesture of unprecedented, incomprehensible love. Mm. He goes all the way to hell to sort of dramatize the extent to which he wants solidarity with sinners. I mean, how can we resist? And if this is all somehow represented uh, in the sacrament of the altar, then why aren't more people there? Right. And why do so many yeah. Catholics sort of trivialize that event by saying, oh, Sunday Mass, what could be more boring? Yeah. But as we're talking about all this, I'm realizing even more, you know, the, the circular nature of things that we had established pretty well that if, if you really are experiencing the Eucharist, you're going to understand better what's in the scriptures, what's right. in the book, because you're, it's going to be going on in your life. But we see from your example, because of your knowledge of the Scripture, you so much more fully appreciated the Eucharist liturgy when you encountered it, probably more than I would have uh, without your help or something or earlier on. And so, you know, a lot of Catholics in Lent say, I want to go to Mass more, and that's a good commitment. But the more they read and understand the sacred Scripture, they're going to really uh, see what's going on there. Even Amen. Better. And their hearts will burn within them. Yeah, you know? yeah exactly. And, and, and then their eyes will be opened to an even greater light, you know. Uh, 
Pope Emeritus Benedict wrote in Verbum Domini. You know, he quoted St. Jerome's famous line, ignorance of scripture is ignorance of Christ. But then he derived from that axiom a corollary that needs to be emphasized, that is, ignorance of Christ's real presence in the Eucharist is itself a form of ignorance of Scripture. That's right. That's right. You know, and so it creates a feedback loop. It doesn't just kind of overcome a, a wall. Mm. It, that bridge enables kind of you know, free flowing, free flowing traffic yeah. back and forth to get much more out of the Eucharist yeah. and Scripture. And, and, that's and a all of example. this, I, I think, is implicit in the logic of love. If you really love someone, you want to leave more than just a couple of note cards. Uh, you yeah. want to leave yourself. That's real right. presence. Uh, that, I mean, that's the kind of proof that, that finally satisfies. He's here now in our midst mm. as food. Mm. Right. And that's a profound thing to, for, for all of us to be doing during Lent is, is going deeper into Scripture, going deeper into the Mass, finding whether it's consuming the Word or, or so many other good books or, or tapes or talks, just to go deep into the Mass, to see what the Scripture... I mean, are there particular Scriptures you think you would recommend? Uh, to any of our viewers during Lent, any, any, anything to go deeper on, particularly Holy Week as we go into the, the celebration. Uh, well, I always love the Gospel of John, just like Ratzinger did, you know, and especially because it gives us a much fuller account of, uh, the, uh, of Holy Week. You know, mm. when you look at Matthew, Mark, and Luke, about one-third of their Gospels is devoted to Holy Week. It's been described yep. as a passion narrative with a long introduction. <laughs> But that's truer of John. Half of John, mm, you know, right. is yeah. that last week and uh, the, lo- the, the, the final discourse. Uh, but I would also encourage people to use this opportunity to share the word, to evangelize, mm. to pray, to sacrifice, and to take risks for loved ones and neighbors and co-workers. Mm. And to enter with a critical sympathy into the unbelief of others by acknowledging the fact that we struggle too. Yeah. You know, yeah. they read the Bible, it's too human to be divine. They look at Jesus, he's too human to be divine. But the fact is, the humanity is the instrument of the divinity. And so if you can see what God has accepted in us to give us what is His, mm-hmm. you know, it's not ultimately up to our rhetorical skill. It's the power of the Holy Spirit who will work through the word of the cross and show us that even in our sharing, His power is made perfect in our weakness. Excellent. Uh, stay with us on Franciscan University Presents. Last Lent, I decided to add going to adoration um, every day as, as aside from like my sacrifice. And I would bring along my Bible and just through praying through the Psalms and the scriptures, I found a lot of healing. I grew closer to God and it just made my Lent very fruitful. So perhaps this Lent we could widen our scope of scripture beyond the mass readings to really seeing the whole of salvation history um, as God plays it out through all the old Testament covenants that he makes with his people, which ultimately culminates in the eternal covenant, which is written in Christ's blood, which we celebrate every Sunday at Mass. My name is Joseph Frelich. I'm a chemistry major, biology minor here at Franciscan University. I love the atmosphere, just completely centered around the Catholic faith. When I play soccer, when I'm in classes, everything is, has that same Catholic attitude. Myself and a few other chemistry majors had the opportunity to work with top scientists in order to combat neglected diseases. I was able to connect my love for chemistry and also my love for mission work by synthesizing chemical compounds. Franciscan University is academically excellent and passionately Catholic. Welcome back to Franciscan University Presents. We've been talking about consuming the word with Dr. Scott Hahn. Uh, we're at our final segment. Uh, so Regis, could you start us off with some final thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I think it's probably fitting that I say something about Lent uh, because we're in the midst of all of its rigors. And uh, I think on day three, I was already terminally weary of uh, <laughs> the penitential season and I had just given up sugar in my morning tea. But before I get to that, I I, I did want to pick up a thread that had been left just at the end of the last session. I mean, it's a thread from this coat of many colors that you have woven really quite wonderfully together in this latest book. This is what, number 40? (laughs) Who's 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 counting? And and that uh, has to do with the point you made about, is this book too human? to be God's Word? Is this guy too human to be uh, divine? And then it struck me, am I too depraved 
uh, to be divinized? Uh, and the fact is, no, I'm not. Uh, there's hope even for, for us, uh, for us human beings. And, and that, I, I think, leads into Lent. And for me, uh, I think perhaps like yourself, John uh, is the figure uh, who is closest uh, to my heart. Mm. He's the clear-eyed eagle. Nobody has seen more deeply uh, into the things of God than the theologian, the visionary. And, and his, his gospel begins at a pretty high level. I mean, you can't get any loftier than the eternity of the pre-existing word. But what is so startling is that this word descends into the flesh and becomes meat, uh, carne, uh, you know, the, the logos becomes sarx, and that's pretty shocking. That's the scandal of particularity, mm -hmm. and we are meant to encounter this enfleshment uh, in the desert of, uh, of Lent, and it doesn't have to be a desert. I mean, when you meet Christ, suddenly you've got, uh, you've got you know, waters that constantly flow, but uh, Lent is for those of us who, who experience, more often than not, the absence of his presence. And so we ask God to sort of awaken the hunger uh, for his presence, which lies so often concealed and submerged between the pleasures we pursue. They're, they're certainly uh, present enough, but his presence is, is what we crave most of all. And Lent, I think, reanimates that, that hunger and that desire. And to read a, a book like Consuming the Word, I think, is, is such a marvelous preparation for Eucharistic celebration. Mm, mm. Yeah, so thank you. thank you, Scott. Thanks, Regis. Uh, Don. Well, as I read the book and we've been having this discussion, uh, one of the things that's really come into my mind in a clear, clear way, what I really appreciate more, is how valuable the Catholic approach to Scripture is, especially in the information age. You know, mm -hmm. the mentality of the information age is something has value if it gives me information. And a lot of you know, times approaching sacred scripture on those terms, you say, well, what information is a couple of stories or something like that? It's not gonna really carry over into my life. But with the Catholic approach to sacred scripture, we see the point is to go there to get an understanding of a, an event that's actually happening in my life. Mm. And I'm not just getting information, but getting reiteration of an experience right. that I'm having. Now, sometimes I say, oh, I'm not having that experience, and that's an indication that my life is not all that it's meant to be. I can check my own experiences by the experiences that the Bible is describing taking place yeah. in Jesus, in his apostles, in the ones that were preached to by the apostles, all of this. So really getting over the mentality that I want information from the Bible or I want some thoughts from the Bible, but getting the idea that I'm supposed to come away with an experience that's being described, is it in my life, is it not, where can I find it? Uh, this is ultimately gonna lead us back to the church because that's where the Eucharist is and where the experience uh, will be. When we think about it in Lenten terms, I can give a good example of how this has you know, played out in my life just in one way. Uh, Psalm 32 and Psalm 51 hmm. speak about confronting sin and it's a lot of what we've been saying. We sort of grasp our humanity, grasp our sinfulness, but both those Psalms go from confronting our weakness to the power of God, the greatness of God, they all end on hope. They start with our weakness and all end on hope. A lot of times I see that in my life, in, the, in my sacramental life, but sometimes I don't see that and I know I need to capture it, I need to go find it again. That should be happening in my life, what's happening in those Psalms. That's great, thanks, Tom. Scott? Wow, <laughs> Yeah. Uh, just to synthesize, I mean, are we too depraved to be divinized? I mean, that just captures it. Uh, no, it's precisely when we acknowledge our own sinfulness that we are rendered capable of being divinized, you know, and the fact that we're not just reading to be informed, you know, the Word of God is a person before it's a page, therefore it's performative, not just informative, you know, it's like this is my body. That's more than informative, that's performative, that's transformative, even more than when I said the words I do standing next to my bride. I mean. When we enter into the mystery of the new covenant as a divine family, suddenly we discover that the image of the Father is this Son who is greater than our sin. Our sin is no match for God's Son, and He has come to give that sonship to us. You know, and Lent is a great reminder too that he who is forgiven much loves much. Mm. You know, and guys like me, you know, who are forgiven more should be loving much, much more and entering into a joy that this world can never contain any more than old skins can contain new wine. 
But there's one last thought I'd like to close with that I haven't touched upon, and that is the role of the fathers of the church. Hmm. It's overwhelmingly the case that almost all of the fathers were bishops, and that's no coincidence or accident. They were fathers because they were bishops, they were bishops, and so they were fathers. And that's not just true back then, it's true today. Hmm. We have got to approach our bishops as fathers of the church because they're the ones who can confect the Eucharist and turn men, mortal men, into priests after the order of Melchizedek. We ought to unite our hearts to our bishops mm -hmm. as children to fathers. Uh, they're not perfect, but you know, apart from God, no father is. Yeah. And so in, in, in this season of Lent, I would really suggest that we approach Holy Week by uniting ourselves to the bishop Consider going to the masses, you know, in the cathedral, even if it's an extra 25 minutes. But unite your heart to the successor to the apostles and thereby unite your heart to the sacred heart of Jesus who instituted this organism that is a family. Mm. And it stretches throughout, you know, down through the ages and all the way from earth to heaven where the holy apostles still are alive, you know. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you, Scott. Thank you for both being on the program and for writing this great book. I think it's going to be a great tool for a lot of people to go deeper uh, into Scripture. Um, if you've enjoyed today's uh, program on consuming the Word, uh, whether you can buy the book uh, at wherever good books are, are purchased, but we have a free download for you at faithandreason.com. The talk is Sacrament and Doc Document, What is the New Testament by Dr. Scott Hahn from the St. Paul Center. Uh, you could also just ask for free and we'll send you a CD of that same topic. This whole program, uh, we've been talking about the Word, and uh, it, it's key for us because the New Testament is linked to the new evangelization. Uh, they're both new because we need the newness that comes with the present of being present to Christ. Um, God is here in the Eucharist. He is present to us in the sacraments, and we need to frequent the Word of God, and that's Scripture, and that's meeting Him in the sacraments. So let's, let's take our time this Lent and, and visit our Lord and Savior. Um, this program, Franciscan University Presents, comes from the mission of Franciscan University, which is forming the students who are transforming the world. And I want to invite you to be a part of our mission, possibly by getting your degree here on campus or through our online and distance programming. Uh, or maybe join us at one of our summer conferences um, or our pilgrimages to holy shrines around the world. Or come and visit us at faithandreason.com where there's great talks, going deeper on all of these topics, things that you'll really want to uh, be a part of to be, be tools for the new evangelization. Until next time, may the Lord bless you and keep you. To download the free handout on today's topic, go to faithandreason.com. Email your request for the handout to presents at franciscan.edu. At faithandreason.com, you can also purchase past episodes of Franciscan University Presents, or request today's free handout and purchase past programs by calling 888-333-0381. That's 888-333-0381. Or call 740-283-6357.